I'm Dr. Sean Olfman, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to the Science and Pseudoscience of Mental Health podcast from Ad in America. In 1955, Eric Fromm published a book called The Sane Society. And the basic premise of the book is that cultures that promote our existential needs for love, community, autonomy, creativity, purpose, meaning, and communion with nature are ones that enable us to become fully actualized and sane human beings. Cultures that fail to meet these core human needs set the stage for mental illness. I am so pleased to welcome our guest today, Dr. Darsha Narvaez. She's an award-winning author and scholar and a professor of psychology at the University of Notre Dame. And Dr. Narvaez takes up the mantle of Fromm's quest to identify and promote sane cultural practices. She integrates the sciences of neurobiology, anthropology, and psychology in her research on human development and human nature. So in other words, she moves beyond the philosophical and really grounds her research in compelling science. She very generously uh, shares all of her research, her writing, podcasts, conference proceedings, uh, etc., on the University of Notre Dame website. So her work is very accessible. Dr. Narvaez's research is urgently needed today because there is such persuasive evidence that Western culture, which is being rapidly exported and adopted globally, is undermining our mental and our physical health. We see here in the US and in many countries in Europe that we are sliding back into attitudes of nationalism and fascism. Our planet is at a tipping point of ecological sustainability. So our very existence as a species is under threat. And increasingly, we seem to be more in relationship with our devices than with each other or with nature. Ray Kurzweil is the chief engineer at Google. And for a couple of decades now, he has been actively researching and enthusiastically promoting what he believes is going to be the next stage of evolution. And he calls this the singularity. And what he believes is that uh, in the next decade or two, we will escape our frail human bodies, our inferior human brains, and all the messiness of nature as we merge our consciousness with our technologies. So this artificial intelligence or AI future is very popular. And I believe that it is as popular as it is. It's perceived to be a superior future to a human future because our cultural practices have removed us from even knowing and understanding how extraordinary and wonderful and irreplaceable it is to be fully human. Dr. Narvaez, I'm so pleased to be with you uh, today. And the first question that I have for you is, can you paint a picture for us of what a fully actualized human um, is, what their qualities are, um, what it feels like to be fully actualized human? Yes, I'd be delighted to, and I'm wonderful. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you. Uh, and I, what I do is I rely on uh, Abraham Maslow's description of self-actualization. I mean, he really captured it with his many characteristics. So I'm going to just describe those. Uh, one is to be emotionally present in the moment, 
the capacity to be actually here relationally attuned to others, not be preoccupied with your own ego or your own resentments or your own history. You're fully cleansed of all that and you're here now. And so that takes some effort if you've collected some trauma through your life. Right. Uh, and uh, these people um, are able to really perceive reality appropriately, uh, in part because they're not carrying all that baggage. Mm -hmm. So they are more comfortable and they're more flexibly attuned. They accept others as they are and don't get threatened easily. Uh, they are more spontaneous with others. They can be themselves. They've nurtured that capacity to really uh, follow their own inner spirit. Everyone's unique, so that's a uniqueness uh, that they present. They're oriented to problems rather than uh, their own um, ego, uh, trying to solve problems, getting along. And they have sort of a, a, an autonomy that we don't usually uh, realize is um, part of being able to follow that spirit without feeling like they have to suppress themselves. So there's an autonomy uh, and a detachment from the culture's uh, mores or, or uh, strict uh, ways of being. It's not that they're not um, uh, moral or virtuous, they are, but they don't have to follow the particular uh, cultural mm -hmm. rules for a particular situation mm -hmm. and they they are able because they're coming from the heart coming from their intuition mm -hmm. able to appreciate and connect in a way that maybe is outside the usual cultural way uh, so they don't uh, fall they're not fragile they're not uh, uh, falling into kind of us and them kind of thinking they're able to be really uh, human and empathic with others, they're able to uh, be fully emotionally present, but then not be caught up in me, me the, the emotionalness of the me. It's more mm -hmm. of a, a flowing um, uh, energy of, from the universe, we could say, that flows out to the relationships and then the connection. So they, they are able to have deep interpersonal connections, but they're also, uh, very oriented to accepting the other and, and democratically um, kind of egalitarian in an egalitarian way accepting others and relating to others so it's it's quite a um, interesting set of characteristics they they also have a sense of humor but it's not hostile humor it's not put down humor it's mm -hmm. self maybe down degrading humor uh, and and they um, are able to uh, resist falling into cynicism or uh, negativity and because they're more in tune with the greater energies of the universe um, I suppose there's different ways to talk about that uh, they are creative they're um, capacious in all sorts of ways and quite perceptive and intelligent so I, I discuss intelligence as being flexibly uh, responsive to the situation and they're able to do that. So those are sort of some of the characteristics of these people and we, Abraham Maslow um, uh, described a few. He said he had a hard time finding some of those. He had to go to biographies and mm -hmm. autobiographies and then he found a few friends he knew and then he made this list of descriptions mm -hmm. Which I think is quite interesting because it, f it matches up with what we see in um, our ancestral context. What are people like in small band hunter gatherer communities, which I use as a baseline, which we'll come to later, I think. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that's such a beautiful description. And um, you do talk quite a bit in your research about. Um, uh, small band hunter gatherer cultures, and that while you know each culture is uh, each of these cultures is unique, that they share certain common elements that are elements of kind of sane cultural practices that really enable the members of their cultures to possess the very qualities that you just described, and so. I'm wondering if you could just talk about some of these kind of 
common elements that you have discovered within their cultures that promote self-actualization? Yes. So one key feature of this sane society is to provide what I call the evolved nest. And that is um, the needs that we have. We're very immature at birth. Uh, 18, we're, we should be born 18 months later. Don't tell moms. <laughs> but we're like fetuses until 18 months of age. And so we really, and even after that, we have a lot of needs. We're very plastic and shaped by our experience um, in early life in particular. And so we can talk about the evolved nest. That's, so that's one thing uh, that's really important for developing a neurobiology of sanity. And another one is, uh, and you can see this in the Native American communities that have been uh, described, uh, they emphasize connection. So whenever something goes wrong, they attribute it to a disconnection. And so it's really important uh, this nest that we can, I can describe more in detail, mm -hmm. provides a, a, the sense of connection, the continuum of living in the world as a living being, uh, which Jean Liedloff talks about. I encourage people to read the book, The Continuum Concept, because she talks about this continuum that she noticed in Amazonian tribes that she lived with, that they were with the baby, the child, they were keeping that child with them and, can, and the child gets a sense of being loved, connected, and um, vital and confident and all these good things of sanity. <laughs> uh, whereas in the States, when she would come back, she would notice the disconnection in children. And I just wrote a blog about that. But I think that's what's happening with our violence in the USA. Uh, we've got disconnected people, layers of disconnection. So that I think that's a fundamental piece is the connection that we're all in this together. We uh, that we have a sense of being community members with one another as human beings, but also with the animals and plants and the other natural entities. And that makes you grounded on the earth and makes you then attentive to your uh, responsibilities as a community member and your uh, support from the earth, from others uh, to flourish. What is it about small band hunter-gatherer culture that enables them to create these um, qualities or these elements? Yes, yeah, so I should explain what I mean by small band hunter-gatherers. These are mobile, they're, they're migratory, foragers and they're in small bands so usually from 6 to 25 maybe sometimes larger but they keep their fluid boundaries people come and go because they have high autonomy uh, and they have no possessions to speak of they might have a, a machete or something um, but they don't have animals they don't domesticate animals they don't cultivate plants they're mobile uh, they don't do any of that in any systematic way and so they don't have things to fight about uh, although someone might go into a jealous rage at some point, a guy usually. Uh, <laughs> but there's really not a sense of hierarchy. They're fiercely egalitarian, so they, the p adults don't coerce the children. Mm -hmm. And I, I uh, write about how I think the punishment, corporal punishment, is actually shifts neurobiological development towards self, mm -hmm. self-protectionism. And so you don't see that here. So you see a, a sense of just uh, the ability to grow in a, in a um, unique way as a human being. Uh, mm -hmm. Colin Turnbull, the uh, anthropologist, writes about this in his book, The Human Cycle, contrasting his British upbringing with uh, his uh, examination and living with the Mbuti in Africa. And... Um, he says, you know, he was punished and neglected in ways, uh, treated by nannies, really very detached from his parents growing up and going to boarding school. And then he gets to adolescence and he feels empty. Whereas in the Mbuti children are so supported and allowed to play and, and move about as, you know, following their their intuitions, building good intuitions, good in emotional responses, that by the time they reach adolescence, they're ready for life. They're mm -hmm. ready for adulthood. Mm -hmm. So really big contrast. And we, we tend in the States um, in particular to 
undermine that kind of flourishing development that we see in these other communities. That, that's such a foreign con concept for American parents, the idea that it is not only possible, but preferable to raise children without discipline and punishment. Um, that in the absence of discipline and punishment, you're going to have, you know, uh, children with uh, huge egos who uh, don't know how to function in society. And in a sense, what you're saying is that the opposite is true, that this is right. what actually undermines their development, yeah. which is really fascinating. So when you punish a child, you're focusing their attention on themselves mm -hmm. and they don't feel safe anymore. And you've broken the, the sense of trust in the universe mm -hmm. and the world and and now they have to build a protection system. They have to build right. defenses. They have to build an ego to get right. through. And they have to have some explanation. Well, usually they blame right. themselves. I'm the problem. I'm bad, right? And then they carry that with them throughout life. And they can't be in that self-actualizing mode we talked about at the beginning, flexibly attuned and open. Right. They've got all the baggage with them. Right. And so... And, and and I think that this is a like a really comp complicated issue, you know. So what would you tell a parent whose child is not doing pro-social things? They're I don't know damaging property or not sharing or you know. And and I think that the complexity is that within the constraints of not the constraints but the potentialities of a a really healthy, sane culture you are less likely to see children acting out in these ways. So it's a kind of a chicken and egg kind of thing. Right. Would, and so there are cultures that they've never heard of terrible twos. What's that? Mm -hmm. right. The people from Latin America, and right. at least with traditional child raising, right. they yeah. never heard of it before. That's right. because, you know, there is the autonomy surge, I call it, the surge for trying to test out your skills and your abilities at age one and a half, two. Right. And you want to run around and, you know, try, you know, the stick and see what it does. Mm -hmm. And what happens in, in the USA typically is the parents punish that, right? Because they, mm -hmm. they don't like, it looks like the child's out of control. It looks like they're being aggressive. They're just testing themselves. Right. And so in these other cultures, there's no sense that you have to worry about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You you know, you uh, redirect it or you make it a game or whatever it is right. they're doing. And you don't think that they're actually a human being quite yet. They're still right. learning, you know, for a right. few f years. So there's much more flexibility and, and acceptance. And tolerance of, of, development. of those kinds yeah. of behaviors. So given that we're not going to return to our, you know, small band hunter-gatherer, um, origins. Are you, can you identify a technologically advanced either culture or subculture or community that exists today that tends to incorporate the kind of, uh, you know, the same cultural elements that, that we could kind of hold up as, as an example? I think there are um, pieces uh, that different advanced nations are doing that are uh, we can model ourselves on. Mm -hmm. I think probably we have to talk about what the evolved nest is first, and then I can okay. point to particular okay. things that people All are right. doing. That, that sounds like a, a, a great idea. So just going back to something that you uh, touched on earlier, this idea that we're born too soon, at perhaps as much as 18 months too soon, just as a kind of a place, uh, almost a point of curiosity, um, if you could kind of talk about, well, what are the, you know, what were the evolutionary compromises that, um, uh, you know, created this issue that we are born as much as 18 months too, too soon in this incredibly state, the state of incredible physical and neurological vulnerability. And if you could just sort of talk about what is an evolved nest, you know, not only for humans, but for, for any animal, if you could kind of just take us back there and then we can talk about what the evolved nest of the human is. Okay. So our um, evolution, um, moved us from walking on four limbs to walking on two, uh, the human um, evolution. And when that happened, the pelvis had to shrink and to be able to walk on two legs. So if you look at chimpanzees, they have much wider pelvises. And when the pelvises shrank, then our babies had to be born 
uh, earlier because the heads otherwise get too big uh, for getting through the birth canal. And so that's one of the key um, features of why we're born so immature. And we look like, so other animals, a few hours after they're born, can walk around and feed themselves. You know, you've seen sheep and goats and, and calves and horses do this, um, but we can't do that until about 18 months. And around that time too, our, our uh, top of our head is still soft, right? Because the expectation is that the brain is gonna develop a lot after birth. And so you have to make room for that growth. And so you don't wanna harden the skull yet until after that super amount of growth in the first 18 months. And so those are the kind of uh, features we have to realize. Uh, I wrote a blog called One Most Important Thing to Know About a Baby, and that is that we're born so immature. Mm -hmm. So then what you need is the baby needs to experience more of an external womb experience. Like, uh, so what does that mean? That means calmness, keeping them happy and optimally aroused. So, um, that means you know, you're carrying them, you're responding to their needs, lots of physical touching and rocking, that's what they expect. And uh, with that, the brain then is and body are getting the right signals to develop their systems correctly in a way that's optimal for health and well being. And um, we can see that uh, our nest, then, like all animals' nests, were evolved to match up with the maturational schedule of that child. Mm. So our nest is particularly intensive but we're social mammals and social mammals are at least 30 million years old and they emerged at least that long ago and they have all these intensive parenting practices too we modified them slightly but um, many of them are that old meaning that they really supported our ancestors uh, adaptation or survival so should I talk about our nest in particular? Yes, yes, please do. Okay, so the social mammal nest, ours is just modified slightly in terms of breastfeeding length and number of uh, caregivers. So we uh, uh, really evolved to be um, raised in a village. So it's multiple adult caregivers, not just mom, not just mom and dad, but a set of caregivers because our, our needs are so great. So we need to be carried. A lots of affectionate touch uh, in that first year, pretty much constant. And actually our heritage is to co-sleep or bed share with people all throughout life. It keeps us in good health. Uh, and uh, so there's uh, affectionate care, responsiveness to need. So keeping the baby from getting distressed because what the baby practices is what they become. So if you have them scream a lot, they're gonna have a personality of screaming, right? Of really being annoying. So you wanna keep them in the optimal uh, state, uh, calm and, uh, but also connected. And then that, yeah, that signals the hormonal systems to develop properly. The stress response is not hyperreactive and, and so on. The vagus nerve gets set properly, which runs through all the systems of the body and uh, keeps you healthy and keeps you compassionate and connected. And then there's, so that's uh, affection, responsiveness, uh, the village also of caregivers who are responsive. Then there's breastfeeding. This is usually a shocker that the average, uh, so the way the, the source for the information of the nest is from these small band hunter-gatherer communities all over the world. Anthropologists have studied them and then they've summarized what are the same things they do with babies. Right. These are the things I'm telling you because right. they represent 99% of our history as a human genus. Mm -hmm. So it's only the last 10,000 years, probably 5,000 right. years or so, we've shifted away from this nest right uh, to the detriment of our societies and the planet right so then there's um so breastfeeding is then on average four years mm -hmm. you think why well breast milk has thousands of ingredients including all the immunoglobulins you need to build the immune system which takes about that long takes several years to develop properly uh, to adult levels uh, and then it's got all the stuff you need to build the brain well, um, tryptophan for serotonin receptors, which keeps you happy and smart, um, that kind of thing. Um, then there's free play, self-directed free play. If you put young mammals together, they will run around and play. If they feel safe and well, they will play with each other. Why? 
because it's growing. They, they, know, they know what to do to help themselves grow and flourish. And playing is one of those things. Right. And then a positive support for mom and baby. So the mom feels like the baby and she are wanted. And then she's more attentive. The baby then feels connected and part of a right. community. Uh, right. positive climate they can, they have a positive impact and then the last one is the soothing birth experiences mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. soothing perinatal experiences right. so that means the mom right. is pretty calm during pregnancy the, at birth is calm uh, there's no separation of baby and mother at birth mm -hmm. there's no painful procedures all those things mm -hmm. all these things when you violate them are right. violating our baselines exactly. and we have neuroscientific evidence for their damaging mm -hmm. So I'm, I want to go into the kind of the neuroscience momentarily, but yeah. it's just, um, you know, it's, it's uh, striking that pretty much every one of the variables of the kind of the evolved nests that you talk about are ones that are challenged here in the U.S. So, you know, ironically, we're so... <sighs> you know, we're so big on this notion of ind independence or autonomy, or at least our version of it, that we separate um, caregivers and infants long before the infant is ready because the infant is in such a state of immaturity and that the irony is that it actually undermines rather than supports autonomy. Um, we're so big on early academics that we... Um, you know, and getting kids into all kinds of what we imagine to be, um, you know, enrichment programs that we undermine play. Um, we, uh, our hospital births kind of violate the, the, the calm, soothing birth experience for, for mother and infant. And so there's so many ways that um, from a place of wanting to or imagining that we're doing what's best. We, and, and again, I think it's also around the autonomy issue. We don't want the baby in the bed with us. We don't want the baby breastfeeding until four years of age because, again, we think this is going to create a dependent child. But what you're saying, this is going to create a healthy and highly independent child. Correct. Yeah, so yeah. we have it backwards yeah. in so we, many ways. We have, we have it backwards in so many ways, which is is really unfortunate. And just to kind of circle back to a question that I asked you earlier, if you could point to, um, I don't know, a, 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 a group, a community, a culture that is technologically advanced, that um, perhaps has gotten at least more of these elements right. Yes, those, well, certainly there are pockets of communities where mm -hmm. people are aware of these things. Uh, Attachment right. Parenting International has fostered the, this information in many ways. Mm. Uh, in other advanced nations, uh, we can point to them for different pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. The U.S. is really behind the times. We're one of the maybe only two countries in the world that doesn't have maternal leave after a birth. Right. Which, it's pretty uh, paid, shocking. Yes, pretty paid shocking. maternal leave. Right. Um, and right. so there are countries that have up to three years, I mean, uh, of paid parental leave. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, your amount diminishes over the years of how much pay you get. But that, that's very supportive of mm -hmm. this kind of nest provision. Right. That you don't have to worry right. about going back to work in a few weeks. And so mm -hmm. I'm not going to breastfeed because I don't want to have the pain of having to stop. Or, you know, and you right. send your baby off to daycare and you don't know really right. what they're doing. And daycare centers right. are not very good in the States. Mm -hmm. um, so on right. average. Uh, so, but there are other countries that are more um, aware of various things. So that parental mm -hmm. leaves promotes bonding and breastfeeding and responsiveness. Right. Uh, other communities are more oriented to letting children play. There are forest kindergartens now or forest preschools mm -hmm. where kids are out in the natural world, which I didn't emphasize, but that's part of how you get connected to the natural right. world, which we've also right. So, um, and then there, in the U.S., we allow infant formula to be advertised and given free to moms mm -hmm. and um, make it sound like it's, oh, it's about as good as breast milk, you know, like they're, right. you know, just a little different, you know, but actually it's right. millions of miles difference, mm -hmm. right? Thousands of ingredients versus a couple right. uh, dozen and, yeah. in the and wrong that, yeah. shape, in the wrong type, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so. 
Yeah, right. And that, that becomes such a complicated issue because so many women do have to go back to work so quickly that they don't want to feel guilted. They don't want to be told, well, yeah, breastfeeding is best, given that they're now in a kind of a scenario where that's just not, it's not something they can give their babies. But I think that, you know, at the same time, that kind of undermines the intelligence of women who would rather know how, you know, be informed and make informed choices so that we can change policies rather than kind of keep them in the dark so that we can, you know, send them back to work, you know, days or weeks after they've, they've given birth, because it's just such a uh, harsh and shocking experience for the mother and the infant to be right. so, you know, uh, separated and so stressed immediately, um, you know, after the, the baby has come into the world. It's, it's, um, it's so problematic. So you either have the mother who's rushing back to work and the baby in a possibly just not ready for a group daycare experience or the mother isolated at home without the kind of the village of of support but either way it's as you're saying it's it's far from far from optimal so i'd like to um get into you know specifically brain maturation because you know you're saying babies are born much too soon with very immature brains. And in your research, you cite the work of Alan Shore and Ian McGilchrist, who are very, who really emphasize right brain or right hemisphere maturation, especially because it happens first. It happens in the sort of the, the latter stages of um, gestation and in the early months and years of life. And when the baby is so vulnerable, so right hemisphere maturation is especially vulnerable to that, you know, having an optimal evolved nest. So I'm wondering if you could kind of just flesh that out, why, you know, why right hemisphere development is both so vulnerable and so important to, um, uh, to our well-being. Yes, yeah, so uh, Alan Shore has done terrific work analyzing and integrating all sorts of research on early experience, and and he finds that the right hemisphere is scheduled to develop to develop more rapidly at that time, mm -hmm. and it's critical for self control, self regulation, all sorts of systems of getting along with others, uh, and so um, if it's undermined, if you're not developing it, so if you're so uh, when you stress a baby, they're not going to develop the stuff that's supposed to be growing in the right hemisphere, right? You're, they're going to just try to stay alive. And so you're enhancing the old systems, the primitive systems of survival, which includes a stress response and in other systems of panic, emotion systems of panic and, mm -hmm. and fear and rage. And uh, so what's supposed to be growing uh, doesn't have a chance to grow. And then if you're leaving the baby to cry a lot, like cry it out sleep training does, um, you are then increasing cortisol levels so much that anything that has grown, because what, what happens after birth is lots of synapses are supposed to be growing to grow their intelligence in various ways. But cortisol levels melt those synapses. So you end up with a kind of gappy brain. And then what do you have left to work from? Well, you have the survival primitive systems fear right. and jump into that easily, you know, safe, right. unsafe. And then uh, your neuroception, you're always kind of like this. And you la you have to latch on to something that makes you feel safe. And so people, right. adults, we see latch on to an ideology of script of some sort. And they're very black and white thinkers because Interesting. that's all they... They, that's right. all they learned to do. They didn't learn this flexible attunement, which requires a lot of practice with lots of different people uh, and growing in a way that's um, supportive, not mm -hmm. this stressed kind of orientation. Right. And, and again, it's this kind of paradox of, you know, Americans wanting to do everything faster and better and imagining they're going to kind of push their babies out into the world before they're ready um, and give them what they imagine to be all kinds of you know, baby Einstein type brain stimulation, when in fact, the unfortunate paradox is that they're undermining healthy brain maturation. That, That's right. That the best thing you can do to grow a baby's brain is to lovingly hold your baby and play with your, your child and, you know, create these opportunities, the free play in nature. And when they're younger, you know, loving, lovingly uh, uh, parent them 
is what actually grows the superior brain. That's right. And the right hemisphere is scheduled to grow throughout childhood. Mm -hmm. And the left hemisphere is the, our conscious mind. It's the little kind of narrow, very small part of who we are. We're mostly right. our right hemisphere and subconscious processes. But the left mm -hmm. hemisphere, as Ian McGillchrist pointed out, kind of likes to think it's in charge. Right. And if you start to uh, teach a baby how to read words and all, you're pushing them into that kind of thinking, this conscious right which is not scheduled to develop at that time. And so you're right. undermining, again, the development of what's supposed to happen. Right. And then you end up with a child who can get good test scores, perhaps. They know how to do that stuff. But they don't know how to get along with anybody because they right. missed all, that, those, all those pieces. And they shift then. And that, this is what I see in adults in the States, is you've got people who are very focused on intellect, you know, and they're very detached emotionally from relationships in any deep way right. or flexible attunement. Right. And or people who are oriented to, you know, uh, dominance and submission. So they only know how to get along with others if they can be in charge or if they submit to some authority right. figure. And so you switch between those two parts of the brain functioning mm -hmm. and you're missing this ability to get along in an egalitarian way with flexible intelligence. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, this kind of like this connection between healthy right hemisphere development and, you know, it's my understanding that the right hemisphere is also, like, just going right back to what you were saying at the beginning about a fully actualized human being being kind of really present and in the world and with you and not sort of lost in their abstracted head, yes. which is more left hemisphere. So, you know, when we um, grow up in an evolved nest that enables that right hemisphere maturation, that we um, that the right hemisphere kind of contains the potentialities to become fully actualized, whereas when we kind of skip over that stage because we um, you know force babies to sleep alone, we um, cut off breastfeeding, we cut off play and uh, uh, time in nature so that kids can at two and three years of age be learning to read we're kind of sort of top heavy with a, a left hemisphere and a kind of a, you know, uh, a, um, a, an underdeveloped right hemisphere. And then we can kind of see this mapped out to some extent in the cultures that we create. Right. Because the, the left hemisphere is oriented to grabbing from the right hemisphere what, what's mm -hmm. been experienced. If you haven't experienced anything, whoops. I mean, right. you got to, then you got to, Right. you know, be taught some rules or some script mm -hmm. to follow because you have right. nothing, no personal knowledge almost. Because, because you're not kind of in the world, in your world of experience and then kind of abstracting from that. So you're in this kind of narrow abstracted world without the, you know, the direct experience. Right. Um, so that's, that's so interesting. And you also, in your work, you talk about, you know, you are already referenced that, you know, the part of the brain that is kind of that fight or flight survival brain. And then you talk about those regions of the brain that kind of connect us to other, or, or you know, that we share with other mammals and those aspects of the brain that are really uniquely human and the importance of being raised in such a way that we have this really wonderful balance among these three systems. Could, could you talk a little bit about, about that and how we optimize this kind of brain development and how, how these three systems uh, operate um, yes. with each other? Great. Now, this is part of my triune ethics meta theory, which um, discusses from Paul McLean's triune brain theory, uh, very helpful in, in understanding how our brain can go into global mindsets. So when you're afraid, when the stress response kicks in, you can, when it overwhelms you, you just see red. You're just, you're caught in this, you know, a need for self-protection in some manner or other. Whatever you've rehearsed in the past, whatever worked in the past is what you're going to go to. And that is the, what I call the survival self-protectionism, essentially. Uh, and that is, is uh, you're born with that, and you can enhance it up, as I, we were talking about, when you leave babies in distress a lot. But what has to develop after birth are the mammalian kind of connecting emotional systems, care, love, play. Those are things that we have to experience to develop. We're ready to develop them, but you have to have the experiences to develop them well. 
And then with, as we grow older through childhood and into adolescence and adulthood, our executive functions grow. They're not really quite finished till about age 30 now, the That's neuroscientists amazing. tell us. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So that those are the abilities to, mm -hmm. for self-control, uh, at least in um, planning, foresight, uh, empathy is also part of this, these systems. They have to be well established also in the first year, as Alan Shores pointed out. You gotta have that nice responsive environment there for the seeding of those, but then they're finished up later. And those systems then are gonna work those abilities to abstract, to imagine possibilities outside of the present moment are, are gonna be fueled by these other emotion systems, more uh, subcortical systems. So, if you have never developed the care and play kind of systems, the, the very relational uh, attuned systems, your abstract thinking will t uh, tap into those survival systems, protection is interesting. You use your imagination, your ability to plan and think ahead, fueled by those kinds of systems. So it'll be either about dominating others, uh, being uh, righteously uh, imaginative, because you want, you, you have a hard time taking in other people's realities and you think yours is the one that's true, you'll either be very uh, domineering that way with your imagination, or if you learn to dissociate as a baby, meaning that your parents did not recognize your emotions, didn't, were not consistently supportive of your emotional responses, you learn to dissociate from them, right? And, you, and they encouraged your cognitive thinking, right? And right. you become a high achiever and <laughs> you use your imagination then to imagine things that are really disconnected from your relational responsibilities. So you build bombs, you build, you know, things that destroy because you have no sense of, you know, caring very much about things. So at least that's, these are kind of basic um, ways to use imagination. The Buddhists have like, I don't know, dozens of bad mindsets to avoid. And I'm just naming a couple right. here that right. are what I see in the States right. that we've emphasized the viciousness right. towards others, wanting to make my way the way, or right. this detachment from reality. And, you know, well, we have a good idea, you know, and you don't think about all the consequences and you're right. in the moment responsibilities to care and respect the other. Right. That's so interesting. And this really taps into the next kind of um, theme that I wanted to explore with you, which is that, um, you know, one aspect of being human, um, which we share with our mammalian cousins is, um, you know, that obviously we're very biological, we're embodied beings, um, that we need to be capable of being in relationship with each other, in relationship with our ecosystem, both the one that resides within us, our microbiome, and the one that surrounds us. Um, but that we're also, um, it's also equally human to, uh, to desire autonomy, to be creative, to be self-inventive. And I think that you've just described some of the ways in which these two, uh, you know, complex needs, sets of needs can work in synergy with each other or can work in kind of competition with each other. And so, you know, I, I think um, what I was referencing earlier, Ray Kurzweil's The Singularity, you know, this idea that we can um, separate, we, we can remove ourselves from, even from our own bodies, um, from each other, you know, be more kind of in connection with our technologies, be, um, you know, removed from all the messiness of, of nature and kind of engage in self-invention that denies our embodied biological selves that are part of all of nature. And so, um, that when these two sets, these, these two human prerogatives kind of uncouple from each other or uh, connect in problematic ways, that this is when we move away from saying cultural practices. Yeah, so 
uh, that's quite a fantasy he has <laughs> that we can be disconnected from our embodiment and the right. planet, essentially. Of course. I mean, we won't be humans anymore, of course. Right. Right. So uh, right. perhaps uh, we are creating an artificial intelligence that will take over after we've destroyed everything else. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I... I think our responsibility, and this is, uh, I get this from indigenous societies, our hunter-gatherer societies, uh, our responsibilities as humans is to be the coordinators of the flourishing of everything else on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what sustainable societies are oriented to. Uh, right. The Kung of uh, Southern Africa have been around 150,000 years. They refuse to be civilized i guess uh and to move into the the way we are uh kind of detached from our responsibilities to the planet disconnected right. i think what's happened instead is so my analysis is that we've taught since in the last few hundred years in particular but probably since agriculture started we we started to teach ourselves to be disconnected from our planet from the uh, needs of others uh, other than humans. Uh, and so once you start to disconnect and you isolate yourself like in a city or something, you, you start to get afraid of those others and you want to mm -hmm. dominate them. So right. part of that is we've undermined the nest, we've degraded the nest. And so we've right. built disconnection into the way we raise kids. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it seems fine to just be in your head and or just do AI, artificial intelligence, right. and right. Eh, who needs a body, you know, because you're disconnected from your body and, right. and you don't exactly. know how to, how to make it work properly because you didn't have those early, really critical experiences. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to parents who are living in a Western, urban, technologically advanced environment who want to offer their children that evolved nest, who want them to be sane and to be fully actualized, how can they kind of create a, I guess, a culture within a culture? What would you, what would you advise them to do? The first thing I often say is to want less. So in our uh, small band hunter-gatherer societies, we see that they don't want that much. They're happy to just be in the moment and enjoy life. So they have a lot of leisure time, uh, laughing and singing and dancing and uh, being silly with one another uh, because they don't have to work very hard to get food. It's usually uh, pretty available, at least in the traditional places. Um, so I think what's important to know is that babies need intensive care only for a few years uh, uh, and after that then you could probably be back into whatever uh, and coordinating as a family but those first few years it would be best if someone can stay home mm -hmm. with that child or bring in uh, grandparents and others who are caring wise elders mm -hmm. to help care for that child and in a way so that the child is immersed in a, a nest that is consistent, that's not the uh, different caregivers like a daycare center would have who's not really, who don't really know the child and treat them mm -hmm. more like an object than a person. Right. Uh, right. So I would uh, arrange my life with a newborn around um, providing that nest for mother mm -hmm. too, mother for the parents and the child right. so that they can actually be responsive and Right. Find places to play in a city that's a little harder, depending on the city in Minneapolis where I grew up, uh, every six blocks there's a park mm -hmm. intentionally, but other places are a little hard, harder to find. So you'll have to build in um, field trips to places where the child can learn to connect. Um, uh, it's a little harder these days. But the rest of the nest, you know, being responsive, providing breast milk. I mean, other countries provide wet nurses when a mother's milk doesn't come in. Uh, we used to have wet nurses uh, providing young children milk if the mother is doing something else. But mm -hmm. we have to think more, uh, be more imaginative about how to provide the nest than we have been. Instead of saying babies don't need it <laughs> and denying them right. uh, what they evolved to need exactly. and just assuming they, they don't need it and giving up on it. We need to figure right. that out. That's what we need to right. use. 
patients for. Right. And so, you know, again, getting back to kind of problematic um, kind of modes of self-invention, we can't just invent ourselves out of our evolved nest. Um, right. Those are, you know, we evolved to, to need these experiences and these, these qualities in our early, early life. So we can't just decide, well, I've decided that I'm going to be this way. My infant is going to, to be this way. But I just, I want to go back to, you know, this idea of um, wanting less, being less, uh, you know, ambitious to have a lot of stuff and make a lot of money and that in an optimal universe, um, one or both parents would stay home or grandparents would be with, with the child. And so I just, because I, I just want to really kind of reinforce, you know, because you were saying earlier that alloparenting is best. It's not, so it's, you're not in, any sense saying, oh, we should go back to this kind of 1950, uh, 1950s ideal with the mother's kind of home alone with the no, 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 no. child, but, <laughs> but not that at all, that it doesn't even have to be the mother, although the mother has to be available for, for breastfeeding, but um, the act of breastfeeding um, doesn't take all, all day, that, that optimally the, the child should have like a village of adults who really know this infant or child well, as opposed to the, the revolving door that you often see in a daycare of really poorly treated, underpaid um, caregivers, um, often understaffed, who have very little motivation, you know, because uh, they're, they're not respected and paid well as professionals. So that even like theoretically, you could have an evolved nest that involves a daycare, but it would have to be, and, and there are such daycares, but they're absolutely the exceptions rather, rather than the rule where the caregivers are paid extremely well and they're respected and they're encouraged to know a lot about child development and they stay with that infant for, you know, many, many months. Um, and there's a very low caregiver um, infant ratio, it's just that, unfortunately, the vast majority of daycares don't even begin to meet um, those, uh, those qualities. And if they do, they're wildly expensive and available right. only to the very, the very elite. That's right. So you do want the village raising that right. child in some right. fashion. It doesn't even right. have to be a biological uh, mm -hmm. parent. I mean, it just right. could be uh, someone adopted of course, adoption right. or, or neighbors and such. But um, it's important to, to understand, too, that you don't want just one caregiver in part because that doesn't build the flexibility that child needs. They're building their schemas for how to get along. They're generalized conceptual structures that are embodied um, for how to get along with others based on their early experience. So if they're only exposed to one person, one way of doing things, they're going to be pretty rigid later. Right. And they'll be flexible in the way that our uh, species evolved to be. Right. So, and what about those of us who are already adults, who didn't have the privilege of being raised in an optimal evolved nest, and here we are with our overly exercised left hemispheres, <laughs> you know, overly reactive fight or flight responses, but who want to achieve um, greater sanity, to be more <laughs> present, more fully present to our experiences, more fully actualized. Um, what can we as adults do to, um, yeah, to increase our own um, well-being? So uh, the book I wrote, uh, published in 2014, Neurobiology in the Development of Human Morality, Evolution, Culture, and Wisdom. The longest chapter is on what to do if you didn't get the nest, you didn't have the early experiences you needed to develop your brain in the way that species typical. Right. And so there's like three basic areas. One is to learn to calm yourself if you are hyper stress reactive, you know, you have to learn techniques to calm yourself down, like deep breathing. I do that with my students, visualizations, you know, of connection and calmness and peace and loving kindness. Uh, and then that, well, that's not enough to rebuild. You need to establish a sense of social joy because maybe you didn't build those, you know, bridges to feeling great with other people or skilled and great. 
Uh, and so you have to have experiences of, of playing is the best thing. And so we, we know from the neurobiological research that playing face-to-face -face free play, like with a young child chasing them around, wrestling, keeps you in the present moment and grows that right hemisphere. So it's really uh, a marvelous way, a fun way. You have to let yourself go, of course, and you have to then be in the moment and not be worried about something else um, for that to work. And then that's not enough either to restore our human capacities. You have to then rebuild your imagination. So build it from a sense of connection, from a sense of responsibility that you are actually uh, in relational or build your attunement actually to the natural world, to other people. We do that in my classes uh, so that they get a sense that they're not alone. No matter where you are, you're not alone. There's all these other living things around you that are, uh, tuned in and you can be tuned in and so um, to rebuild our our imagination to be not only uh, socially responsible but ecologically attuned is really important I think right now we've right. kind of we're seeing the the what's the result of disconnection from that the natural world and how much we've destroyed it's right. just unbelievable right. so in every sense right. yeah right. So growing our imaginations, our relational imaginations, as opposed to our imaginations uncoupled from yes. each other and from nature is, is really a, uh, such a wonderful sentiment. And, um, you know, certainly in the, the psychotherapy world, um, uh, ther therapeutic approaches that are really designed to um, help us with trauma and help us with stress and help us to be mindful are very much in the foreground. So that's a really good thing. Yes. So I, let, can, let me say one more yeah, thing. I just uh, wrote a blog. I think it's called Relational Disconnection as Mental Illness. Mm. The DSM, the Diagnostic uh, Manual for Psychiatry and Psychology, does not... Um, acknowledge that a murderer or a conspiracy theorist uh, or people with who behave from those perspectives um, or murder because they're like, like we just experienced recently murdering people from another group uh, or trying to murder them uh, it doesn't recognize that that's an illness uh, because the person feels might be feel fine and it's not an illness in that manual Whereas in indigenous cultures, that is an illness. It's the disconnection that's causing harm to the community. And that harm is going to reverberate. Everyone will feel less safe, less trusting, less connected. And that has to be addressed. And so restorative justice in the indigenous perspective is about reconnecting and making sure that person who's done the harm realizes the harm they've done so that they actually shift their perception and then they, they become a healing agent rather than a destructive one. Right. And um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, so we, so we need to really kind of um, acquire more kind of uh, uh, control. We need to calm our, our stress response. We need to be more relationally creative. We need to play more. We need to recognize that the desire, you know, uh, uh, aggression that is out of control even if we enjoy it, is, is, is absolutely the opposite of mental health. And I, I'm wondering if you could, you know, in these somewhat troubling times, um, if you could say something about what we can do from a kind of a community perspective. I, I felt like you were starting to touch on that. Um, you know, so there are things that we can do as individuals or for our families, but what about at a community level if we want to kind of act collectively to reintroduce uh, saner cultural practices? Well, first thing is to uh, help parents provide the evolved nest. So that means giving mm -hmm. pay parental leave really critical uh, for everybody. Um, and then we need to kind of, in my view, the big thing would be to reorganize society around families and children and their well-being rather than around corporations and money-making, which is what right. we're doing now, right. uh, which is undermining everything. Uh, David Corton has a book, uh, Change the Story, Change the Future, where he, he was one of these people who went around the world to push uh, societies into debt 
and then uh, take uh, you know into um, capitalism and privatization, and then that uh, they had high social wealth, high ecological wealth. They didn't have much economic wealth, but now then it all reversed. So then they get high economic wealth. Their social wealth is destroyed because they've mm -hmm. uh, commodified relationships, and then their ecological wealth is destroyed because people came and extracted everything and mm -hmm. left toxins. So right. there's a way that we have to re change our narratives about who we are mm -hmm. and right. what's important. Well-being should be primary. I mean, it used right. to be primary in every other society, but in mm -hmm. the last few hundred years, you know, money making has gotten the, the right. you know, as the the big thing. So that's one mm -hmm. key thing. And then how you trickle that down to every community and focusing in on the local control, local support of every family and child. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. So th so those are really, really wonderful um, thoughts. And, you know, so, so we need to um, create policies that really, really support families and the welfare of children, especially in their infancy and early childhood. And that what's interesting is that when we do that, then, you know, infants and children who are the, then have more of this kind of evolved nest developmental experience, that in a certain sense, their narratives intuitively change because what feels right and what makes them happy and what gives them pleasure is so different that when we enculturate, in a sense, our children, we start to change the narrative. Right, because uh, otherwise they're very easily pushed, pushed mm -hmm. around by fear and right. anger, and they right. don't have control over their, their, their condition to be mm -hmm. uh, conformist, really, right. which is what we see across the USA. Right. Well, thank you so much for this wealth of insights. I appreciate your time so much. Do you have any uh, final um, thoughts or ideas that you would like to, to leave us with today, or do you feel we've covered what? I have we, a couple things. Fantastic. Uh, one is uh, the, the signs of hope. Uh, Baby-friendly hospitals mm -hmm. is a sign of hope. It's uh, spreading across the USA. That's where uh, really it's very breastfeeding friendly to mothers. Don't separate the mom and baby, skin-to-skin -skin mm -hmm. contact right away. That really uh, helps with the bonding. You're, right. Both the baby and mom are ready to, to mind meld to their, their hormones are just really active after birth, ready to connect. And so that helps uh, support that and then know, uh, help them with breastfeeding. And then another initiative is the first thousand days. All over the world now, that initiative is getting um, more and more traction where the United Nations and then other governments, uh, uh, governments and um, worldwide uh, units are now saying we really have to focus in on those first thousand days. First thousand they tend days. to be focused on health issues, you know, like food and and warmth and such, but they really need to also include the evolved nest. The, the evolved nest. Well, thank you. I appreciate that so much that you're kind of leaving us with signs of hope, the, the baby-friendly hospitals and the UN kind of global initiative to really focus in on those first thousand days. And I think that that's so important. And, you know, again, our kind of media fuel, our, our media kind of fuels a lot of fear and stories of, you know, that are so negative and that it is important to recognize that individuals and communities and, uh, you know, uh, entities like the United Nations are actually doing the right things and moving us in the right in the right direction. So thank you so much for that. This has really been wonderful. You're welcome. Speaking with you today. Same here. Thank you so much. You're so welcome.